to introduce our guest this evening, and I'm going to do it a little bit of a roundabout way because, uh, as I mentioned to her earlier, I do a bit of mentoring and coaching at the office, and I've come to the realization, as have many people in companies, I think, that in this country particularly, mentoring and coaching are such essential parts of running a business, particularly with the new generation coming in. Our experience is that uh, graduates have got good theoretical knowledge, but absolutely no scar tissue of the real world. And this mentoring helps. And our speaker is very apt from that point of view because she is a strategic innovator, as well as being a business owner and her company's called Kindle Consulting. She comes from a legal background, but I won't hold that against her. And she has made a profession out of life coaching, executive coaching and change management. And I was quite interesting to see that one or two of her clients uh, that she has are ESCOM. She was doing quite a lot of work in the ESCOM power stations. Well, clearly something's working because we haven't had power cuts for a while. And also with the Standard Bank. And uh, having just been through a course on cultural diversity, I'm fascinated to hear what our guest speaker has to say about the topic of her conversation, which is going to be cultural diversity. So it gives me great pleasure on behalf of all our members and our guests from all over the place to welcome this evening our guest speaker, Annelien van Veek. Annelien, you're very welcome. Thank you, David. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm just getting my start. That's why I take a break. I'm sorry, I'm used to a different brand. So I struggle with this. Thank you. Awesome. She's an apple snob. <laughs> Thank you very much, David, for that kind introduction. Um, it's very special for me to be here. The Rotaries are close to me. Um, my grandfather was the president of the Rotaries in Queenstown in the 60s. And my father matriculated when he was 16 in Queenstown. And the year after, when he turned 17, he went to Iowa to live with a family there in Mount Pleasant. And he went to school for a year in the States. Now, that was quite unusual, I think, in, in the 60s. Um, and today, my dad, unfortunately, has dementia. But when he looks at his scrapbooks, he remembers he dated the homecoming queen. If that's true, I don't know, because <laughs> he's quite a nerd. And um, he's got some photos to back it up. So um, he was quite chuffed. I'm sure he forgot it now, but he was quite chuffed in the moment when I said to him, Dad, I'm talking to the Rotaries today. So thank you, David, and thank you for having me tonight um, and, and for that kind of introduction. Um, I think today is very clear. No, you just have to show me how to skip. Let me just go. Why is it not screaming? There you go. Okay, so I think we can all agree that business and the way we conduct business has changed forever. And tonight, it was so nice to see everyone online and the typical Zoom circus that we always witness. Hi, can you hear me? No, I can see you. No, I'm on my app, iPad. No, you're on your cell phone. There's always some kind of drama going on in the background. So welcome to everyone that has joined us on Zoom. I can't remember a time where we didn't go online and live online and suddenly the world is smaller. And that's great, but it's also kind of scary. It's scary that you can have people in your living room from all over the world in a few seconds. Scary because we need to up our game technologically as well as culturally understanding how to interact, but also fantastic because of the opportunities. I'm a member of the Business Network International and our chapter has recently had a networking mixer with a chapter in Malta. So someone in our chapter made a joke about a Maltese poodle. 
<laughs> and we all killed ourselves, because that's typical Michael joke, and no one laughed. The people from Malta stared at us like that. And I realized, okay, the Maltese poodle might not be from Malta. <laughs> so that was my realization immediately. So um, do you have the right soft skills to adapt to this new world? Because we don't work online. We live at work. So for those of us who work from home or has been for a while, work is now longer than before. We struggle with boundaries. People expect you to attend meetings six in the morning. There's no such time as, sorry, it's dinner time, Master Chef has started, take the call later, none of that. It's now go, go, go. On the one hand, we're grateful if you can do business. We, we're grateful that if you have a job, so that's the, the mix, mix bag that you have. But people are burnt out, people are tired, and they emotional at, at the moment. You know? So it's a very difficult time. During um, lockdown, I, like many other people, thought, okay, now it's my time to learn new skills. I'm gonna maybe speak Spanish and crochet and you know, bake seven layer cakes. And then someone posted on LinkedIn and said, if you didn't master this and this and this by now, then time wasn't the problem. You are the problem. And I immediately liked and shared and liked and shared until I saw, wait, every person is different. Every person's circumstance is different. So we can't have a one size fits all. And now suddenly everyone has to pick and be happy at the same time. We went through a grieving process and we are still going through a grieving process. So do you have the, the soft skills to, to cope with this? In May this year, Forbes magazine published the top five skills that you need in the workplace to succeed. The first one is the creativity skill. Now I have so many clients who have reinvented themselves. Engineers who now produce sanitizer <laughs> in their factories. No, or P, PPE, whatever. They suddenly creative, think outside the box and just keep on keeping on. Thinking out the box, they made it and are still making it. People who aren't are paralyzed because the world has changed. Can you sell? Can you convince people? I'm a sales coach and my brand promise is terrified to terrific. I help people to sell that are, first of all, snobs and look down on salespeople because they think you like secondhand car salesmen or you like the wolf of Wall Street. But the truth of the matter is we all have to sell ourselves every day. You have to be able to persuade someone. And that is the second skill, not just what you're selling your product, but that you have a solution and that they need to jump into action. Can you collaborate? Suddenly, I facilitate a team coaching session for one of my clients, team members from India, from Belgium, from Denmark, from the Netherlands, and from Johannesburg and Natal. And yeah, I was facilitating a team session. In the middle of the team session, the one guy from India said, sorry, anna Leon, why is your accent different from Richard's accent? And then Richard jumps in and says, no, 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 she's actually Dutch. And then someone else, no, 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 she's not Dutch, she's Afrikaans. And then the guy from the Netherlands starts yapping in, in Dutch. I'm like, yo, I have no idea what you're saying. And I say, no, actually, Flemish, in my mind, is closer to Afrikaans than Dutch, where the person from Denmark would suddenly burst out chatting to me. So I'm like, yo, <laughs> wasn't prepared for that, explaining how this whole thing fits together. So. In a second, in a minute, we were all in the room and had to collaborate. Now you look on screen and you see everybody and you see, okay, the guy from Denmark is taking this team school from his son's bedroom in some toy car bed. So he's balancing the laptop. <laughs> and I don't know if he thinks he's invisible, but it's quite disturbing scenes, you know, like 
dinosaurs in the background, etc. So you struggle to concentrate. And then you have one guy who looks like he's an undertaker, you know, like no emotion, very dark suit, doesn't show like nothing, blink, nothing. So we think, is the screen frozen? What is happening? <laughs> so suddenly we had to collaborate different. Adaptability, and this is a quote that's been attributed to Charles Darwin, and apparently it's not from Charles Darwin. It says, it's not the strongest of the species or the smartest. It's the ones that are the most adaptable to change. And wasn't that just true? And South Africans are resilient. I'm proud to be South African. We're resilient. You know, we get on. Skrik, skrik, law, carry on. You know, that's how we are. And I think I've seen people thrived. And I'm hopeful because they have adapted to change. EQ. Yo, a lot of people that I coach, EQ is so low. I don't even think it registers on, on the radar. Meaning understanding self first and how you relate to others. So those are the top five skills that you need to survive in the workplace. 85% of your financial success is due to your skills in human engineering, your ability to communicate, your personality, how you relate to other people. If you're an introvert, extrovert, if you're a perceiving personality or a judging personality, only 15% due to technical knowledge. Wow. So you can be book smart, you can be really dumb. No, so most people have come to that realization that they need to up and mind their cues. So the intelligences that we refer to, is obviously your IQ, can you retain information? Can you learn a new language? Which is important, especially if you have a technical job, you're an engineer, you want to know that that person has a, a crack education. Emotional intelligence, how you relate to other people, understanding self and understanding others. Spiritual intelligence, I'm part of something bigger. I have compassion. I understand social impact investment. I'm not alone in the world. Adaptability intelligence. And then lastly, cultural intelligence. And this is what I want to talk about tonight. So a lot of people say cultural diversity, you need to leverage the benefit of diversity. The problem is diversity is used in, in specifically in, in South Africa, if someone has done something wrong, then they are sent on some cultural diversity train together with anger management or whatever coaching is required. Where my feeling is, yes, cultural diversity is vitally important, but it needs to be interwoven into the business strategy. Can't be a single event. I wanna share with you what I, what I mean with cultural intelligence. And I don't know how to go back, so let me just see if I can go to the previous slide. This is quite a disturbing statistic. So the Society of Human Resource reports that 70% of business ventures fail because of cultural differences. You know, just people leaving, resigning, you had a, a supplier, didn't get on, didn't understand. All that 90 percent of executives that were interviewed in 68 countries said cross-cultural intelligence is a top challenge. Now, I can understand that looking at my coaching that I do and how people are misaligned. Not to say intentionally, we, we are just different. So what do I mean with cultural intelligence? It's the ability to function in a cultural diversity and to be comfortable when you function there. So first of all, what is needed? You have to want to, you have to want to. You have to be confident with who you are as an individual. And when you are comfortable with yourself, then you can be comfortable with other people. So it starts with confidence and the drive to say, how can I adapt to this situation? Because I'm comfortable with myself. Secondly, the knowledge, similarities and differences. What are the values and norms? We always start with the differences, whereas we should focus on the similarities. Because when we start with the similarities, they far outweigh the differences, far. 
then we need to have a plan. And this plan needs to include what we call cultural mindfulness. Cultural mindfulness. What do I mean with that? When I show up in a situation that is culturally diverse, I need to have an in the moment attitude. Not coming in with a stereotype, not coming in with a preconceived idea. I have to be open and excited to walk in and say, wow, your accent is different, but I'm excited to hear what you have to say. You look different, but I want to talk to you. And then lastly, your action, your verbal and your nonverbal behaviors. We think people don't understand what we say. They understand very well what you say. I remember an, an incident, and my husband Arnold in front will remember it. Um, I think my son was about three or four, and we were in the Edgars in Santon, and there was a Muslim lady, and he said very loud, Mama, why is the lady hiding in a dress in Afrikaans? Suddenly the entire Santon was fluent in Afrikaans. <laughs> and the lady was amazing how she handled the, the situation. No, it's just a child make, making an observation. What, what, what am I seeing? You know? But the way we treat is so important. Cultural mindfulness. I just want to take a minute and focus on that. If you ever step into a situation where you are open and you are excited and you are curious to meet other people, and mindfulness be, means being present in the moment. Do you know what happens? The other people show up differently. The minute you walk in with preconceived ideas, you will find those stereotypes there. The minute you walk in with an open mind, curiosity, a learning attitude, you will find them. People show up that way. So diversity and identity. Diversity and understanding diversity starts with yourself. If you ask, why can't you see it from my perspective? Rather change it to say, help me see what I'm missing. How should I change my language? No? So three things need to happen when you show up authentically for other people. We have three identities. The first one is our personal identity, secondly, our social, and then thirdly, our organizational identity, how we work together. So your personal identity is your character, your genetic makeup. My grandfather, if he were alive, he would have sat there in the corner, had his whiskey, laughed and said, she's from that side of the family, the musicians, the people that drink wine, the ones that are too loud. No, he, will, he will say that because I know where I come from. I know what I have. I also know what, how I was raised, you know, the values, et cetera, the beliefs, the environment, the experiences. All of that have shaped me and made me the person that I am today. As a child, you were raised in a specific way. Maybe not just by your parents. If you went to boarding school, you had a specific experience there. If you were raised by your grandparents, you had a very specific experience. So how were you raised and what are those tapes that are playing in your mind in terms of your beliefs? And then lastly, it's very important to understand through your personal and your social identity, how do you show up at work? Some people rock up with a 1987 playbook and I think let's, let's try and apply it, yeah? But unfortunately, as an adult, your identity is not stagnant. As a child, you don't have choices. But as an adult, you have choices. You can be inquisitive, you can decide who, where you wanna hang out, who you wanna socialize with, what values you wanna align with. You have a choice. So sometimes we have to leave some of the things behind that were formed in our personality or in our social identity. And those things don't serve us anymore. But at the same time, we have to embrace the values that we learned. Because that is when you show up authentically. And that's when other people can see you. 
I had a great privilege, and hello, Middleburg. I had a great privilege to work at Duva Power Station and Letaba Power Station in Camden in 2015 to 2018. Now, I want to tell you about that experience and how it came about. Now, if you've never been to a power station, it's the ugliest place that you'll ever see. Not ugly because necessarily of dark and litter, but it's nothing pretty or corporate or, or nice there. It's a functional place. It's a beast. And you go into the belly of the beast and you are scared. Because in corporate, if we make a mistake, you lose money. If they make a mistake, they die. So you have a different mindset when you enter there. It's also a national key point. So the public would never go into places where I've been. So how did I end up a Kugel from Kailami in Duva Power Station? Well, interesting story. I was coaching at a furniture factory in Bosmont. And it was a, a fantastic experience um, for me. And I'd, I had some great results and great breakthroughs with the team. And someone that dated my sister long, oh, many years ago at Varsity, who did his doctorate in change management, he saw that. And he said, do you think you can do this at a power station? And I said, yeah, why not? I think so. I had no idea what, what it meant, what I agreed to. So a French company bought an engineering company in Bronkospreit. You can already see where the story is going. Those Afrikaners from Bronco Sprite used English in self-defense. So they did not like the French people. They did not like the new collaboration where they have to drive to Santon for meetings. Because for them, driving to Pretoria was already a stretch. So they were negative. They weren't happy about the situation. And they were just, like we say in Afrikaans, obstropolis. Okay. So this combination was a kind of a, a recipe for disaster because this newly formed team had to go and train the engineers on site at the different power stations in their new wonderful software that they have developed. So the one engineer would say, look, I will mentor the guy, but I don't want to talk to him. That was what I was up against. Yeah, so then you would have to say, but why? Why didn't you want to talk? And then you had to go and understand what were the barriers that people were facing. If something is different to what we know, we reject it immediately. We look for similarities. So the first obstacle we had was language. People who didn't have English as a first language were communicating with each other. We're having conflict. So you can understand how the lines could be kind of not aligned. And then they try and communicate on WhatsApp groups. So that was another recipe of dis for disaster, because when it's there, it's there. You know, it's you can't you can't delete it. So the, the, the language was a very big challenge for everybody. The second challenge was understanding the different cultures and not understanding that you, you, you can't have a preconceived idea about a person. You have to apply cultural intelligence. And cultural intelligence comes from being inquisitive and curious and wanting to learn, wanting to understand. And some people just didn't want. So it wasn't just the culture. It was also other diversity. So I'll tell you a funny story, and I'll call this guy Jan. Let's say Jan stayed his whole life in Wittbank and started working at the power station when he was 17. And now in his late 50s, he's still there. He's well loved. Everyone knows the guy. He's kind of a tough guy, but everyone accepts him the way he is. So I've been working with his team for a while. And then the one day when we had a team coaching session, Jan put in his head in the door and he said, listen, and Leon, I need to ask you a question, but I have to run to the plant, I'll come back. So everyone was waiting for Jan to come back. 
what was this question? And he was, I was kind of scared. So he walked in and he said, in Afrikaans, he said, I have a little problem now. There's this guy that's gay in my team, a morphe, he called the guy. He says, and I've got extra cutlery for him, but I don't know how to deal with this guy now. Now, I, I see a lot of stuff in life, but that was like, <laughs> wow. Immediately, I realized when everyone's jaws dropped, what happened here? There was no malice. Jan had no malice. He thought it was a term of endearment. He had no clue. So I immediately kind of said to the team, guys, do you see this? Guess what happened? A few weeks later, after a few interventions, he said to me, yeah, Frick is a great guy, huh? Sorry about his husband and so, but he's a great guy. <laughs> I like him very much, but he's not like the others. He's special. See what happens? And I said to him, Jan, if you find one, you will find others, I promise you. He's not special. And that was a, a great, learning for, for everybody. Because we had to realize how we communicate differently and that we are all products of our circumstances. So when we look at how different people communicate and the nonverbal and verbal cues, I so, I'm sorry for the screen, that's a bit skew there. Um, I'll blame the Mac, I apologize. Okay, so I've seen many situations where I would be in a meeting and I would be facilitating a team session and there would be a, a heated conversation. And the one engineer would say, you can't even look me in the eye. Look me in the eye when I talk to you. Get up, stand up. And the more you would shout that, the more the person would look down. No, never, never shout back, never do anything. The guy was like, oh, useless. You know, can't even talk, can't even say anything. That was one thing that I noticed often. I was once in front of an elevator with another lady from a head office and the workers came from the plant and the lift went and they were there first and they went in. And she said, can you believe how rude these people are? What happened to ladies first? So that was another example of misalignment. The same Jan said to me that he has observed many homosexuals at Duva Power Station. No, really Jan? No, he saw men holding hands walking, holding hands. He just want to come and report that to you. So I said to Mian, there are so many things that we need to understand that are the exact opposite of how we are. So in African culture, to sit is a sign of respect. You're never going to challenge your spirit, just stand up and suddenly start, start shouting. The way we are raised is look me in the eye when I fight with you, you know. I want to see your eyes. Completely different. So the minute we started speaking about the differences and why it's important to understand it, we had the most meaningful conversations, safe spaces for safe conversations where people could say, why do you do that? I want to understand. And we could have phenomenal, phenomenal breakthroughs. So I want to share with you one activity that I would do in a team coaching session. Because you might think, okay, but what do you, how do you do it? Okay, so I would have a room of a diverse group like yourself, and we would play a little game. And we'll say, okay, I want you to populate the following island for me. And you can only choose eight people from the list that I'm giving you. And I'm not giving you any other information than what, what you have. Okay, so you all need to collaborate and decide who you want. So this was my list. Jazz musician, HIV positive nerd, ex-commander in the South African Navy, farmer from the Free State, school principal, unemployed youth member, mechanical engineer, taxi driver, politician with 10 years experience in local government, pregnant school teacher, person with a hearing disability, a Cuban doctor, religious leader, and a trade union leader. Okay, guys, please choose only eight that you can take to this island, the Utopia. So without fail, the first debate would be about music. Hey guys, it's tough. We need to open a jazz, a jazz spot. You know, we need to, we need to have a bit of a rhythm there. 
The guy's like, ah, oh, jazz, I hate jazz. That's horrible. It's not even proper music. No, that guy is not coming. In HIV positive, oh, definitely not. Definitely, we have big enough problems. Then the X command in the Navy. And this is everybody. I'm not saying certain people, everybody. Yes, we need that. We need that old guy to come in here and kick our butts and tell us you need to do this and that and the other. And with the fact that he's from the Navy, he's great because we're on an island. And I'm sure he's a Navy SEAL and, you know, he can help us and navigate, etc. So they take it far, 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 far. Then the farmer from the free state, oh yeah, definitely. You know, he will he will plant for us and he will do this and that and the other. School principal, no, let's rather take the teacher. We can develop her, you know, it's fine. Then unemployed youth, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can put him to work very quickly, very, very quickly. Mechanical engineer, for sure. There's not one group that I ever coached that didn't choose the mechanical engineer first. Some of the chemical engineers were with me. Does it have to be a mechanical engineer? But they chose the guy. Taxi driver under no circumstances, not even an idea. Politician, no, he's captured, forget about it. Pregnant school teacher, yeah, we get two for the price of one. <laughs> Phenomenal, that's a great idea. Person with hearing disability, only in all my coaching sessions, one group who said, that person might have other skills. And then the one guy said, no, no, no. We have enough problems as it is. We can't now learn sign language, you know, with a, the Navy commander is going to keep us very busy. Yeah, so, and then the Cuban doctor, for sure. And then the opinions about Cuban doctors and how great they are trained. And so on, and I said, well, do you know any Cuban doctors? No, phenomenal, phenomenal. Government uses them all the time. Best of the best. Religious leader, yes. We need the Enche Duomini to guide us. You know, the past, he must take us forward. And then the trade union leader, forget about it. Forget about it, never. It's only until I ask the people to stand up and tell me what they see. So that they describe the farmer and they describe the beautiful teacher and you know the, the guy, the tough guy from the Navy. It's only when I tell them more information about these individuals that they realize your jazz musician is a tick addict. The HIV positive nurse is actually very healthy and on antiretroviral drugs. The ex commander is a Navy, is a female. And she was expelled because of poor performance. Never ever has anyone thought that that can be a woman. Ever, 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 ever. It doesn't matter in corporate, in tar stations, a woman? Well, never. Farmer from the free state, the black guy? Never. Then, as we go through the list, we started laughing about what we all did. The one that threw them very much is the Cuban doctor, who's not a medical doctor. He's just Dr. Rodriguez, because he's got a medical uh, um, doctorate in music theory. So, yeah, okay, that was wrong. So what did, we, what did we learn about this exercise? And this is really everyone. We all used stereotypes. Doesn't matter who was in the room, doesn't matter which group I did this exercise with, this is really fun. They all use stereotypes. And when I play back the conversations to them, and I say, you said this and this and this. They got quite embarrassed, you know, to say, okay, but you know, we didn't have all the facts. So what is a stereotype? It's that picture in your head. It's that belief that one person must represent everybody. And what happens if you stereotype? You exclude the possibility of finding amazing individuals with phenomenal characteristics. So if we unpack cultural intelligence, it starts with cultural knowledge first. Start with similarities, never with differences. And you will be surprised how much we have in common. Start with skills, relationship building, adaptability, empathy. Before you get upset with someone, think about, did they have to take a taxi to get you? You just got in your car and just, you just went. So walk a mile in that person's shoe, shoes before you can understand their world. Be present in the current situation. Don't walk in with a playbook or a stereotype or preconceived idea. Be here, be inquisitive, want to know, want to learn. The foundation of cultural intelligence is curiosity. How do we satisfy our curiosity? We ask questions. Tell me more, and why did you do that, and how? 
So we have to create safe spaces where we can satisfy our curiosity. I want to share with you a few personal stories that happened to me. So at the power station, I was walking the one day to the plant and I forgot my hard hat. And I walked deep in thought and I realized and I turned back and went to the car. And then this one guy, it's quite not a nice guy, said to me, what are you doing here? So all he could see was the GP number plate and another white consultant coming to the plant. He was not happy about that situation. And I said, scoot up, let me tell you. And we started the most amazing conversation. And I asked him, if you can ask me anything, what will you ask me? I said, can I please touch your hair? Said, okay. <laughs> so yeah, I was sitting next to the guy. He was touching my hair. And it was quite a sight, I'm sure, for the people walking past, because this was quite a, a tough guy. I said, why do you want to touch my hair? No, my girlfriend's got a weave. I hate that thing. It sheds everywhere. Mm -hmm. I want to know if your hair is better. And I said, yeah, is my hair, huh? is it better? No, your hair is weak. <laughs> of course, his girlfriend has a Peruvian or Indian. I mean, I'm not going to compete with this. So it was, a, it was a funny experience for me that touched me deeply. I didn't ask him his name. We had a free conversation, just had a conversation. I saw him once again on the plot and he walked past me and he just touched my shoulder like that. And the reaction that it caused with the other people were quite astounding. You know, like, she's here. And I've never, ever experienced love like that, ever. It's like a wall that would go up for me after three years working there. It was the greatest privilege, the greatest learning for me. But that same wall of love that can go up for me can go up against you. I've seen people lodge a grievance in under 10 minutes. 100 people. Now think for a minute if we had to do it. Now I'm just speaking for the fun facts. First of all, we will debate who needs to take the grievance. So that will be a debate. Then someone will lobby for leadership position and say, no, I'm a better speaker. I can do this, etc." Because we like to be individuals. Then when I decide, okay, we decide, Anlian, you the guy, you can take it to the power station manager. Then someone will betray me down the line <laughs> to say, no, but they're taking it as well to someone else. So I can just see how it happens. Yeah, it's like one man, one click, boom, done. And if that goes up against you, it is a wall that you can't penetrate. I've never seen people coming together. If it's for the right reason, wonderful. If it's not, wow, that was really something that surprised me. Taking you out of Joe oh, um, Bitbunk now to Johannesburg. So we had the French CEO arriving to meet the team in South Africa. And this was, let's call him Patrice, arriving to the boardroom, starting to kissing everyone, male, female, on the cheek. <laughs> By the time he got to Lerato, which was the fourth person, she was already standing up. And she said, uh -uh, nobody kisses me, just my husband kisses me. And the guy, could, he, he was shocked. He couldn't understand. Like the rest of the people were also shocked. It was a, it was a stunned silence. And he, 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 I had to unpack it for him. I had to explain to him that he, he, you can't just walk in and kiss people, even if it's their hands. You can't just, hello, my lady, kiss your hand. You know, you're not a, some knight. And the guy couldn't understand it. That was quite a, a consternation. So when I do coaching sessions, <laughs> this happens. People who can read Afrikaans, they laugh immediately. And if you don't understand Afrikaans, let me translate for you. Yesterday, I told my wife her soup is not so great, but today it's much, much better. <laughs> so half of the group laughed. And this guy said to me, is that your husband? <laughs> like, no. <laughs> and what I wanted to illustrate with this is how humor can be divisive. 
We think we use humor and everybody understands. In Afrikaans, we speak about the Boerewors Gordijn and people have no clue what you're talking about. And I'm like, what's that? And we exclude people. You think you're funny, you're not funny. You offend people. So I always, always caution about humor. Don't use humor because it's not a universal language. It can be very, very divisive. A lot of people ask me, Lynn, why are you always so angry and stressed out? In traffic, I have myself a little road rage problem. <laughs> so if someone cuts in front, it's like, hey, why? We get excited. And people's like, why? Just let the guy, let him. You know, you, you're just behind him. It's not like you're going to be far ahead of him. Let, let him just be in front of you. Why do you want to raise your, your blood pressure? What's the purpose? What's, what's the reason? So when a unit trips on the plant, everyone's like, oh, we have to run there. Some people would relax, finish their lunch. Because <laughs> the problem's still there. <laughs> I must eat still. No, we, that's a, a very big cultural difference that, I, that I've noticed. You know, like how we work ourselves up and how we get angry over certain things. One thing that the French guy asked me was, Annelien, you just need to decode one thing for me. What is the difference between now, now, just now, right now, and now? Because every time I try and task people, nothing happens. You know, they say, no, I'll do it for you. No, 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 no. Okay. And then you throw in millennials in the mix, and then our time is not their time. Okay. Our urgency is not their urgency. Because when you communicate, you have to be specific. You have to task them specific to say, I need this by this time for this reason, drop everything you're doing now and do it. Otherwise they will think I'll do it, but I'll do it on my terms. And then when you walk past and they're still having lunch, you get so excited and worked up and angry, you just grab the bloody thing and do it yourself. So what happens? Trust destroyed. Okay, so our concept of time is different. Very, very different. So if you have people over for a Sunday lunch and you say, what time will you guys come there? 12.30. You come 12.30. You don't come three, three o'clock. Why? Because you, you were invited for 12.30. Then you say, but what's wrong with that, Anilien? You're still there. I find you there. You're there. You're very much more rigid. Time is fluid. To other people and sometimes I feel more comfortable there now especially my personality type type I I want to hear one click sometimes my stress levels could just go down a little bit if I wasn't so so pedantic other thing is numbers if you have a wedding I had to prove to a friend that on the wedding invitation it said no children said, ah, it's a printed there yeah just, oh, my kids can't come I'm not coming Think about that. If you sit and you attended a white wedding recently, there's not one kid, not one, who's got an iPad or a cell phone. They sit. They listen. Because that's how they were raised. What do we do? Like, yeah, go play in the play area. Here's the iPad. <laughs> so it's just different. It's different ways. When my friends go home, it's almost always a spiritual journey for them. Either a ritual, something is happening. When we go home, we go home. It's not a big thing. So if, if Simba goes home, he might be the CEO of a company. But when he goes home, he will sit with the elders. And they will, they will explain to him things. They will tell him things. So he will say, oh, I've got this problem with this guy at work. You know, he irritates me. And they would give him wise words. I'm jealous of that. I'm jealous that we don't have that. We don't have that culture. If you are an engineer or engineering manager, and you're female especially, and you go home, you are just a female. Nobody cares about your title. That's tough. So you live in two worlds. So you can go home to negotiate Lebola. You can go home for a um, funeral or for an unveiling of the tomb. And nobody knows. 
Because when you come back here, it's different. So it's very important to, to discuss it. And one thing that is helpful is to use humor. Recently, someone that's very dear to us, Omasan, passed away quite suddenly, and she was cremated. And her ashes were stained with Deja because the cremation happened in Dahlstrom and they lived in Kenton. Unfortunately, my son was delivered at the wrong address, but in the same street. And <laughs> when I tell some people this, they, they are beyond mortified, beyond, beyond, beyond mortified. Why? Because we grieve different. Okay, so when you go to an Afrikaans funeral, if you have ever been, what will happen? It will be a church service, maybe 30 minutes, 40, if it's long. And then people will be composed. And then you will go in the church hall. And you'll have tea and some sandwiches, triangle, grass cut off with some mysterious meat filling. And you will wonder, you know, nobody, everyone is sad, but you know, you don't show it. And then you'll go home and you drink a lot home. There, in the, in the black culture, we have an after tears. And you better bring your grief to the funeral, loud. No, we grieve. We don't take a volume to suppress the grief. We grieve, we cry. Men, women, everyone, we cry. We're not doing like, oh, it's hard, it's hard. No, you cry, because you can. Men, women, everyone, it's fine to cry. It's fine to grieve. And then a year later, with the unveiling of the tombstone, guess what? Go through the same thing again. You have slaughter another ritual, don't go through the same processes. So certain rituals we do shorter. And it was a whole learning for me to understand how people show up, how we are different in our joy, in raising our children, in our grief, but not different as much as we are similar. So in the end, we are all human. We all want the same things. And cultural intelligence starts and ends with curiosity and empathy. So these are the secret ingredients. If you want to up your cultural intelligence, empathy, walk a mile in my shoes. Be curious, understand, ask questions. Be honest and authentic. Show people that you see them as individuals. I see you. Sabona, I see you. Not how's it, how's it? I see you. It's almost like namaste. And you are human because I am human. And those were the learnings that I had. It was lovely chatting to you. Thank you very much. And you're welcome to ask me questions. I don't know if people online ask questions, Grace. So. Yes, they do. Okay. Fire away. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Is it off mute? Are there any questions from our online audience? I don't see any hands raised. Okay. Are there any questions? Yeah, Nick. Yes. Um, you mentioned about the dangers of, um, I guess, judging people by, by the cover, right? Um, or, or profile. But isn't that a natural reaction, uh, instinctive? I'm sure, going back, you know, uh, in millions of years, that that we have to think quickly. You don't have time necessarily to ask someone, "Tell me more about yourself," uh, so that you. Can evaluate their strengths and their weakness, whatever the areas of improvement are, and what the, what the, the terms are. Um, so you just say, "Well, I'm going to judge this person. I only have a, a split second. I'm going to I'm going to profile them. That they are interesting. They're not interesting. I'm going to talk to them. I'm not going to talk to them. I'm going to talk to someone else." How do we break away from that natural, instinctive uh, reaction? Very good question. Yeah. The reptile brain decides 0 0.07 seconds if you're a friend or a foe. So naturally, we decide, eh, not my type, eh, danger. 
Okay, so yes, human, 100%. We also conditioned in our upbringing, like we've seen with the, the island game. Everyone jumps to the sun. The, the most important part is to stop after you've done that, to say, I'm aware that this is my belief or my conditioning, but I'm going to be culturally mindful. So I'm going to step in and say, this is how I feel. You have dreadlocks or you smell like weed or you know this, but maybe, maybe. You don't represent this team. Maybe I give you a chance to be an individual. Maybe I want you to show up because I have no expectations. So in that split second, yes, you will feel that. And then you have to say, in the moment, mindful, I'm curious. I've had the most amazing experiences where people looked at someone and said, you have a big beard. I think you're a scary man just to realize, no, that's a teddy bear. You know, that's not a scary guy. But the first reaction was, I'm scared. Then we have to have conversation. You have to create that trust so that you can say, I'm curious to ask you something. I want to know. Tell me about you as an individual. Um, we had in our community where our kids go to school, Many, many, many years ago, Steve Wolfmeyer, famous Afrikaans, famous, famous Afrikaans um, singer. So his kids attended our school, in English school. And we were sitting at the prize giving. And one of the moms said, isn't it the guy from Isidingo? <laughs> and I realized, yeah, he's synonymous. No, he's just, he would have been mobbed 30 k's that way, you know, at a function. Yeah, he was just anonymous. It's just a guy, no, didn't have a persona. So we, we must just give people opportunity to be individuals. Thank you. Pleasure. Any more questions? <laughs>